Now we are recording. Welcome to the DAFC Fundamentals. This is going to be, uh, we do a webinar series once a month, and uh, this is going to be history and physical that leads to DAFC success. I thought this was so apropos uh, with all the Christmas shopping going on that uh, that's the reason why I put that cute little line about learn in one hour how to pay for Christmas in a couple of weeks. So anyway, um, you know, I have to say that success is something that doesn't just happen. It's something you strive for. It's something that, uh, it, you know, successful people are not people who do one or two things just over the top, outrageously, like it's unbelievable. People could never do that. Uh, successful people don't do that. Successful people do a lot of little things repeatedly, and they build habits and do them. And they find that about um, about 80% of the, the population kind of float around. Now, some, you know, a little more motivated than the others, but kind of float around and, and uh, don't really, uh, you know, take as much initiative. And you got about 20% or so to take initiative. you got 10% that really go for it. And the fact that you're in the DAPSI program, that kind of puts you in that 10% anyway. And the fact that you would attend a webinar tonight, you know, the week of Christmas really sets you in that group. So congratulations, you're already on the road to success. Regardless of what I say, you're already there because you're creating momentum to yourself. So what I'm going to do tonight, and if, if you, this is really tailored to a lot of the newer folks, but I will say this, if you've been practicing DAPSI for 10 years, 20 years, um, I really pray you're going to learn something from this, and I really believe you will. I believe that you'll learn things, not because I know everything, but because there's a lot of different ways to do things, and when you hear things from a different perspective, sometimes it opens light bulbs in your mind and, and really opens up things like, oh my goodness, I never thought about that. Just one nugget, two nuggets out of this period of an hour, if you've been practicing DAPSI for a long time, it's going to be well with your time. If you're a newbie or you're just getting started, you just got started over the last year or two, and, and you're just working, you, try, you, you have a chiropractic practice, and, and you'd like to do more DAPSI work, and you're trying to bridge into that gap, well, this is really going to be helpful for you. That's what we're really looking for here. So, okay, so uh, first thing, just to kind of put us where we're at here, how does uh, the chiropractic internist compare with medical family practice? And uh, I'd like to read this just a little bit. I'm not going to read a lot of slides. We're going to do a lot of teaching, so we're not going to do slides. A lot of people are sending me text, and I can't really read them while I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, so I apologize. So anyway, the American Academy of Family Practice defines family practice as a medical specialty which provides continuing comprehensive health care for the individual and family. It is a special in the breadth and, uh, and that integrates biological, clinical, behavior sciences. Now, this is what I wanted to get to. The scope of family practice encompasses all ages, both sexes, each organ system and every disease entity. The family medicine aims to provide, family medicine aims to provide initial, continuing, and comprehensive care while centering this process on the patient-physician relationship in the context of the family. These physicians emphasize disease prevention and health promotion, and when referrals indicated, the physician remains the coordinator of care. Now that is what a chiropractic internist is. We are emphasizing disease prevention and health promotion. And I'm not downing the family medical doctor down the street, but I'm going to tell you he or she's not doing this to this degree. On average, there are going to be some exceptional ones out there, but they're not doing this on average. On average, people come in with blood pressure, they give them blood pressure pills. Somebody comes in with a, you know, earache, they get antibiotics. Somebody comes in with a, you know, whatever you come in with, they're going to get something. You get on down the road, you get a 10-minute, 15-minute consultation and uh, in, out, in that kind of process. Now, here again, I'm not down in medicine. Um, you know, we've, we have a lot of usefulness in, in, in referrals, and, and we're not here to, you know, sit in our little corner, and we hate everybody, and we're the best, and everybody else sucks. That's not really where we live. Um, but I just want to bring this to this understanding that as a chiropractic intern, this is who we are. And this is where we want to be, and this is where we want to project ourselves to our patients, and this is where we want to be in the future. This is where we want to be the primary health care physicians for patients, family. Uh, and family practice doesn't mean that we see dad for full price and mom for half price and the kids are free. That's not family practice. Family practice is having responsibility to take care of, taking care of people from cradle to grave with all the issues of life and helping them walk through it with a chiropractic philosophy. 
that the body heals from above, down, inside out, that the body has this amazing capacity to heal itself. And we as chiropractic internists have this awesome responsibility and abilities that we learn that we can diagnose and we can monitor, we can watch this and we can we can make sure that this body's doing what it needs to do and, and help it along the way to, to remove interference and do all the things we need to do so that the body has the ability to uh, heal itself and do all the things for potential and health and life. So when we talk about chiropractic interns, I'm very passionate about it because I am a chiropractor and I am an internist. I don't say chiropractic internist and I don't say chiropractic internist. I say chiropractic internist because I'm proud of the philosophy of chiropractic. That's what brought us where we are. We believe in it above, down, inside out. We believe in this inherent capacity of the body to heal. But as interns, we also believe that we can be primary and that we are primary care physicians for our patients. And so we want to be able to provide that care for them, whether they have a cold or whether they have, you know, if we're, we're supporting their care for cancer or whatever the case may be, we want to be we want to be the hub of their care in that position. So I just wanted to go in there. Now, to do this, one of the things that we have, really have to get across is that, you know, I like this leadership proverbs, that we really need to develop our ability to be a leader. Now, if you, you might say to yourself, you know, I'm really not a good leader. Um, I'm not somebody who's, you know, this big, um, gregacious person with this big personality that's bigger in life, and I don't just walk in the room and everybody has to look at me. I'm not that kind of person. Well, congratulations. Nobody really, you know, wants to have a personal ongoing physician relationship necessarily with that. Maybe they do, but, but that's not what the requisite is. Really, leadership comes down to this. It comes down to one word, and it's influence. Our ability to influence people is our ability to lead people. So I think that gives us a lot of, takes a lot of stress off. And I like this quote, he who thinketh he leadeth and hath no one following is merely out for a walk. And by the way, as a chiropractic internist, we do not want to be out for a walk. We're, we're, this is serious business and we're here taking care of business. So we want to make sure we are doing what we need to do to uh, make things in the right way for people. Now, the key to successful leadership today is influence, not authority. Now, uh, let me back up just a little bit. I want to key off that just a little bit. Today I'm going to talk about, this evening I'm going to talk about the, the history and the physical exam. And I will tell you, the history and the physical exam is the very first most important thing that begins that relationship with you and the patient that helps you have that necessary influence that you can be the leader in their, in their lives and then also in their family's life. And if, you, if we do it properly, their friends' lives as well. So the irrefutable law of attraction, I love this quote, you've got to win in your mind before you win in your life. Now, uh, here we are in the Christmas season. So there is a there is a scripture that actually says that, you know, and Jesus told the people, he said, you know, when you pray, believe that you've already received it before you receive it. So this is not some kind of weird, you know, quirky, new agey little thing. We got to believe our little deal and whatever. But there's a really solid foundation behind you've got to win in your mind before you win in your life. You, you know, you have to see yourself where you want to be before you can get there. It just is what it is. I have a quote underneath my desk and I'm looking at it right now. It says, and it's by Jonathan Swift. It says, the vision, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. I love this, Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest, he said, I said that even before I knew I was. And so there's really a lot to that. And I love this right here. If you've never had a chance to watch this little shtick from Matt Foley on Saturday Night Live, it's one of the funniest things ever. I don't know. Maybe I've got a warped sense of humor, but I thought it was hysterical. Uh, I want you guys to Google it up. Be one of your assignments and <laughs> give you a good life over the laugh over the Christmas holidays. He's a motivational speaker, and uh, but he's, he's kind of downtrodden. And he lives in a van down by the river, and that's what he keeps on telling these folks. And he tells these kids that he wants the kids wants to be a writer and he tells him he said you know you might think you're going to do great things in your life but I'm here to tell you you're going to just you know wind up to be jack squat that's what he tells him and he said and you're probably going to wind up eating government cheese living in a van down by the river now the point I want to make about that was not just telling that story although I do love the story is that if you ever notice people have a story People have a story, and it's usually, you know, it's usually BS, actually, but people have their own story. They'll, they'll say, well, you know, uh, you know, 25 years ago, this happened to me, and blah, 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 and now I'm the way I am today. 
I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? What I'm saying is, is as a chiropractic internist, if you have a story that's a negative story, if you have a story that's not leading you to success, then I'm going to invite you right now to examine that story and start telling a new story. So there you go. That's enough for the motivation. I, you know, I love this stuff because as a chiropractic internist, we really do have to influence people. Good doctors. Now we're going to shift gears. Now we're going to start talking about the history and the physical exam. So good doctors know what to do. Great doctors know why. You've seen me see that. If you've seen me teach, you've seen me put that up there. And it really is true. But I'm going to say that there really is a higher level of clinical, clinical achievement. And that higher level of clinical achievement is observation. Our ability to observe, our ability to observe is going to have a great deal to do with our ability, ability to have success with patients. If we're able to observe things correctly, then we're able to assess what's going on. And if we're able to observe things correctly, then we're able to observe with what we're doing is working, it's not working, if we need to change direction or whatever. Observation is really the key. So history, let's start there. We're going to do history and we're going to do some physical exam stuff. But history is the key to uh, primary care. It really is. Um, you know, without the history, we don't really know uh, where we uh, where we're at. Okay, so right here, I'm gonna. I just heard that we lost sound. Have we lost sound? Test one, two. Have we lost sound? Doctor Mike, I need to hear from you. Have we lost sound? No, I can still hear you. Okay, so we've not lost sound. Okay, uh, okay. So importance of history, quality of the history is directly proportional to the quality of care given. Check that out. The quality of history is directly proportional to the quality of care given. Now, you might say to me, well, wait a second. You know, I see 12 visits. I see 12 visits an hour. How can I sit down with somebody for an hour and listen to them tell me about all the intricate details of their life? Well, I'm going to make your life a little bit easier because I'm going to show you how to do this in a more um, systematic way. That's going to streamline this very well, and it's actually going to help you do a better job at it. No amount of high, no amount of high tech, low tech technology will ever replace a good history and exam. You know, that's something that there's a lost art to this history and exam. So much today in medicine and so much in the, you know, the, the, the doctor down the street and so much of that is done by the patient walks in, they say one or two or three symptoms, they're given something and they kind of go on their way, they might get a little testing. But there's really a lot that we can gain from this sitting down and understanding what's going on with the patient and doing our basic physical exam. I love this one from Dr. Wrinkle. If one does not suspect, one does, then one does not test. If one does not test, he does not know. Now, before we go into the history, let's look at this. I think this is such an important, this is such an important factor. Um, this is called the base trio. Dr. Ali, he wrote about this in the Townsend letter, uh, and I've referenced that in some lectures. If you, if you haven't seen one of my lectures, I'm doing that, and you'd like to know the reference of that, just get a hold of us on the Facebook page. But anyway, I, I add one thing in here because it wasn't put on here, because we can't get rid of the brain. The brain is really uh, the brain is really the essential element in uh, what drives the system. <clears throat> now this, I'm going to just briefly cover this. I've covered this in length in, in, in a prior uh, webinar. I'll, I'll encourage you to watch that, that. And as well as anywhere I teach, when I, I will teach on these principles. But the base trio starts like this. Pretty much the foundational, the, the foundations of the body come out of the blood, the liver, the liver and the blood, the bowels and the brain. So pretty much everything that's going on in the system is going to be touched by these areas right here. So in, in the brain, we can put the brain and the gut, gut brain axis would be probably a, 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 a more correct way to say that. So brain, gut, gut brain axis, liver and blood. When we have issues with the liver, we have issues in the blood, and the blood could be something like a, a, an infection. The blood could be a lot of different things. The bowel could be anything going on with the GI tract, something going on with the brain. If you have problems in any of these areas, these are the basic fundamental things physiological, from the physiological standpoint, that become foundational issues. When you have these issues, they will generally go up to the next trio, and then we'll start seeing people having problems with the adrenal loop, the thyroid loop, start having some blood sugar dysregulation, and the like. When we're doing our history and our examination, we may or may not be able to detect things in the liver, blood, bowel, and brain. You're certainly not going to detect blood in the physical exam. But you may not be able to detect this, but many times through our physical exam and our history 
and our history, we can actually detect these things. So in other words, somebody can come in and, <clears throat> excuse me, they could have, uh, okay, they could, tell, they could tell us they're tired, uh, they're constipated, all right? Somebody's tired and constipated, they have brain fog, and they have dry skin. If somebody tells you that, I can tell you at least at some level, they've got a low-functioning thyroid. Now, it might not be hypothyroid, but they have a low-functioning thyroid. But, you know, I'll just put this number on it. We don't know the number. Nobody does. But well over 90% of your hypothyroid problems are not thyroid issues. They are issues that are coming from somewhere else. They're coming from, guess what? Many times the brain, the gut, the blood, the liver. So what that means is somebody comes in and they start telling you about these symptoms right here, you know in your physical exam you're going to start looking for things that are consistent with that, which are things like the lateral third of your eyebrows, um, lateral third of your eyebrows, or things like looking for cracked skin on the heel, you know, uh, palpating their thyroid, whatever. And if you're, if you're new to this, don't get all freaked out. You know, you're, you can listen to this video. Of, we're, we're, we're recording this. You can listen to the video. Before we're done with this, I hope to, have, to answer most of these questions. I'm just giving some ideas <clears throat> that when somebody has issues that are going on, adrenal loops, thyroid loops, and pancreas loops, and let's talk about insulin, blood sugar dysregulation, generally we're going to find as a foundation something coming out of this group. Then when this starts happening, after this happens, now we start having problems with hormones, sex hormones, limbic system, neurotransmitters. These people are depressed. Uh, they come in, they want their hormone panels done. Uh, these people are, you know, angry. They're whatever they are, but we have to realize that that could be coming from that, which is coming from that. Now, this can also be di bidirectional. When somebody starts having a thyroid loop problem, it can start causing bowel problems, blood problems, brain problems. So all these things can go back and forth. But just to get the idea, when we start as a, at a base, as we start at a base, we so many times start as our very foundations right here. Guess what? This is the reason why. Brain. We do our chiropractic work, our adjusting has a tremendous influence on the brain. And research is showing that today, but the research that's showing that chiropractic is having a benefit on the brain is minuscule to what we're going to be seeing in the future. Chiropractic has a powerful influence on the brain. It, you know, we start everybody off, generally not everybody, but most people off with blood sugar boot camp. This is helping the bowels, this is helping the blood, this is helping the liver. These are all very foundational elements who are doing our chiropractic adjusting. So when we first start with a patient, there's no wonder why we start with blood sugar boot camp and start adjusting and doing these things because we're working on the base trio. I just wanted to put that point since we're here. Okay, so let's move forward. Health questionnaires are a must. When you're doing a history, you're really going to be challenged. And by the way, let me say this because I didn't say this in the outset. If 30 minutes in or halfway through this presentation, which is going to be about 12 to 14 minutes from now, Dr. Anderson is going to field the questions that you have. If you have questions, write them in, and Dr. Anderson is going to field those. We're going to pick. If you have a whole bunch of them, we might have to answer them on Facebook, but if we have three or four of them, we'll do our best to answer them, and then we'll also do another answer session at the end of the program. Okay, so metabolic assessment form is a great functional assessment uh, health questionnaire. Now, if you're not running this, you need to run this. It's called the metabolic uh, assessment form. Dr. Uh, Datish Karazian was actually the guy that developed this. Um, he is, uh, in, my, in my thinking, he's just a supreme clinician and just a, a great benefit to the chiropractic profession. And uh, he actually was the one that wrote that book, Why Do I Still Have Symptoms in My, Why Am I, I told, uh, I Have Thyroid Problems in My, Oh My Goodness, I botched that up. It's the thyroid book. Why am I, uh, Why am I Test Normal? I Still Have Problems or whatever it is. Look up T. Scarazion. You can, you can get that book. I'll just write it here. Look up Karazion. How many people's names Karazion? How many books could be under his name under thyroid? So just Google that up and you'll get it. Okay, so anyway, what, what this section is, is this talks about the colon. This talks about the HCL. This talks about the small intestine, the pancreas, the liver, low blood sugar, um, it, more into the pre-diabetic, diabetic. This is low adrenal. This is, you know, high adrenal. This is low thyroid. This is high thyroid. So what happens, people will fill this out. And if you're not doing this right now, you must. Tomorrow morning, before you go, if you're not doing this, go to the, go to the office an hour early. 
Uh, print this form off. We have it on the DAPSI Warp site, or just look on the web. You can find it on the web. Get this. Start printing them out, and every patient that comes in from day from this day forward gets this, and any of your existing patients have them fill it out. So what they're going to do is they're going to go zero to three on here. A three means it's really bad. A zero means they don't experience it. So when somebody comes in, then when somebody comes into your clinic and they've got three, 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 three here in this low blood sugar sec uh, section. I can assure you they have low blood sugar problems. It doesn't matter, you know, really, the, the, uh, you, of course you're going to see on labs uh, low blood sugar. One of the things we look at is the LDA or the LDH being lower than 140 is a nice sign of a hypo, of a, uh, what we call a functional reactive <clears throat> hypoglycemia. So, so that would be a good lab. And there's other labs that we've discussed in the program. But basically, bottom line is if you see somebody filling a lot of this out, guess what you know you're going to do in your exam? You're going to do things they are going to look at. Um, you're going to look at things that are going to highlight that. You're also going to do this. They're going to fill, they're going to fill out right up there. They're going to put up here, you know, shoulder pain, uh, neck pain, and they're going to put something like anxiety on here, whatever that is, right? All right. So you already know before you get started with this patient, you've not even seen this patient, and I'm just giving an example. They've got threes, four threes, two threes, whatever they have through here, enough to let you know that they've got a problem in this area. You already know that that anxiety has to be hooked with low blood sugar. You already know that. Now, you're not going to walk in the door and say, hey, guess what? Your anxiety is coming from low blood sugar. You don't do that. So, But what you do is you're going to walk this person through the process. When you do the history, you're going to dig into this area. And when you do the physical, you're going to dig into this area. And then when it comes time to get labs like you need to do, like the chiropractic internist does, then you're going to explain to this patient that all these things are leading to this, and it probably has something to do with these as well. Okay, so I just made one example. You could do the same kind of riff off the thyroid, same kind of riff off the hypo, you know, the hyper adrenals or adrenals or whichever it is. So, you know, these questions help the doctors understand about bowel functions, blood sugar, this metabolic assessment. Metabolic assessment is not meant to take the place of your history. It's meant to start looking at that base trio and the second trio and the third trio, if you will. You're looking for the foundational elements that's causing this person to be healthy or not healthy. And I can assure you of this, you give me a hundred people that are over 40 years old and I will assure you that almost nearly, and I'm going to, I would like to say all, but that sounds ridiculous, but uh, I would be wage, I'd be willing to wager that nearly every single person, I could find something going on in these areas. And guess what? If a patient comes into me and I can show them that I know what's going on with them, they will have confidence in me and I will begin to influence them and we'll start having what we want to have. And what do we want to have? We, you know, our job is not just to do people into more care and this and that. Our job is to open the door because they might not have realized that they're taking high blood pressure medication and they might not have realized that there's a person out there, you, that knows how to go through the process and figure out why their blood pressure is high. There's also a person out there that can explain to them that fixing their blood pressure with blood pressure pills didn't solve the problem. It solved a problem, but it didn't solve the problem. You've got other things going on in there that cause your high blood pressure, and it could be leading you down the path of a heart attack, stroke, cancer, or, or God knows who, what, what else. So, so it becomes very important that we are able to do this. Now, some people come in, and they're all natural. They just want a chiropractic care. That's all they want. And then they have the internists come in, uh, you know, the internist side, and they're like, wow, this is really awesome. It takes them to a new level of confidence of saying, this is a person that can take care of me and my family. So anyway, these are other things. Patient Diagnostic Questionnaire. This is something we run in our office. If you want a copy of it, you can have it. just has a lot of different things, you know, um, feet, skin, urinary, endocrine, for women and men open behavior. And you can, you know, you can go through there and pick through, you know, have people fill these things out. It's very good to get these questionnaires. You need to streamline your history of the questionnaire. If you don't streamline with a history with a questionnaire, you're going to be frustrated because you're going to be sitting there forever, you know, with patients. And sometimes patients have brain issues and they're slow and they, you know, they can't get things across. So you want to do a targeted history, which means have them fill out all the paperwork and then you look at what's going on, see what the base problem is. And what I'm thinking about is this. When I look at my metabolic assessment form, 
I'm looking at what are the big foundational issues that's going on with them, and then I am going to tie a little knot here around what their symptoms are, what their symptoms and their motivating factors for coming in, and I'm going to tie that to their foundations that I'm already seeing. Now, I'm not going to necessarily talk to them about it yet, but if they have symptoms, and I'll just name things, so, you know, chiropractic, they, people come in low back pain, they come in with uh, neck pain, and let's say they have fatigue. Okay, that's kind of a usual complaint, right? Well, somebody comes in and I see they have low adrenals, okay? And I see that, uh, let's say they have heartburn, okay? Uh, let's say they're on Prilosec or whatever the case may be. And I also see they have low HCL, means they, they burp as soon as they eat something. That's in the history. And I see that from the history. I already know that I'm going to start structuring, and it's not an argument with a patient, but let me just say it this way. You are framing an argument with the patient, and, and I don't mean to call it an argument, I just don't have a better word for it, but the patient comes in with one set of beliefs that's over here, and you have a set of beliefs that's over here, and those beliefs look like this. This patient looks like they're going to need very little care, and they think it's going to cost very little money, and the reality is it's not that you want their money, but the reality is when they come in and they've got heartburn, low back pain, neck pain, fatigue, the reality is they're probably going to need a lot more care than they think, and it's probably really going to cost more money than they think. I think you would agree with me on that. So in order for us to have success, we've got to bridge this gap between what their symptoms are that they know and the foundational elements that we know that's causing them. So we have to walk them through in such a way that they understand that we know what's going on with them foundationally, and this is linked to that, and we have to understand what's going on uh, through this situation. And you're going to learn uh, through the rest of this program, the latter part of this program, that I say the famous 10 words. And the famous 10 words that will put money in your pocket and bring much better health to your family, your friends, and all your patients. And that is this. So if you'll learn these 10 words, that is, we're going to need to get some labs on that. Learn how to say that with conviction. Learn how to say that with sincerity. Learn how to say that in such a way where somebody will say, I think you're right. So <clears throat> I do that. I say, that I say those words every day. People come in, I'm like, we're going to need to get some labs on that. Oh, my goodness, Mrs. Jones, I see you have neck pain and fatigue. I also see you have cracked uh, heels down here, and I see that you have little puffs, puffy things under your eyes. This could be a low-functioning thyroid. That might be causing the neck pain, and that might also be causing the fatigue. We need to get some labs on that. And bingo, she says, you know, what reasonable person would say, well, I don't get labs on that. I would rather just you guess. People don't do that. When they know you know, they'll go with you. Do not blow your nose. <laughs> what that means is, in the first, when you start with your history, don't just go in there and guns blazing and, you know, somebody walks in and they have anxiety, like I said a while ago, and they have shoulder pain. And shoulder pain and neck pain that's chronic is very, very associated with a low-functioning adrenal. Just remember that. Somebody has low-functioning adrenals, it's very associated because adrenals will cause, one of the things you'll see as a physical exam find is you'll find that they have shoulders that roll forward. When a person's, because of the flexor tone and all that, but anyway, it's another story for another day. But when the shoulders roll forward chronically, it's going to cause chronic shoulder pain and neck pain. So these adrenal patients have this. So somebody comes in and uh, they say they crave salt, you know, and they say they have, uh, <clears throat> they get irritable if they don't eat. We know they have blood sugar problems. We know that they have an adrenal problem, right? And then they have shoulder chronic shoulder pain. You're not going to have them walk in your door. You've seen them for 30 seconds. You say, Mrs. Jones, I know exactly why you have shoulder pain. You have a low adrenals. That's what's causing it. Because guess what? You have not framed the argument. You know, you already know what you know over here. She knows what she knows over here. The physical exam is the bridge. History and the physical exam is the bridge that gets you, sorry for my black over here, that gets you from what you know to what she knows so you can have this relationship that actually works. We're getting ready to take questions in just a minute. I want to tell this story first. What does a bar game and men's shirts have to do with each other? Well, actually quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> you say, what? My dad used to tell me this. Back in the early days, you know, sometimes before I was 21, I, you know, I would admit here on air, here we are on being recorded, I'm sure there's a statute of limitation. But I used to go into bars, and, uh, you know, one of the things my dad used to tell me, and he wasn't, you know, an advocate of me going in bars, I don't want to present that, but he used to tell me something. He said, if you ever go into a bar and somebody has a game, 
and they want to bet you money on the game that they have the rules of. Do not play because you will lose every time. Because, and you know, the inference is this, is if you set up the rules of the game in a bar and you're going to set those rules in such a way that you're going to win. I mean, I think you would agree with that. Now, we're not in a bar room, but I would tell you this, that when a patient comes into your office, guess what? It's your football and it's your backyard. It's you're the one that makes the rules. It's you that does all the stuff. So have them fill out the forms, have them go through the process. And so this is a process when you're seeing patients, it really is. You're making up the rules. Now, um, you know, people, you, you're working this process so that you can influence them to make a good decision for the health and life. You're not trying to manipulate them. You're just trying to make them show the obvious because, as I said, they come in with a fixed set of beliefs over here that is not going to lead them to success in their health and life. And you can see over here where they need to be. So you've got to bring them from there to there. And the only way to do that is to influence them. And so you don't want to be on a level playing field with the patient. You want to be on the playing field that you have the advantage so you can help them bring them to a better place where they need to be. And men's shirts, I love this one. You know, you go to a men's, you go to a men's shop and, um, you know, a fancy men's shop. And, the, you know, the, the shirts are not placed in shelves, not placed in, you know, they're not just, you know, put over there and every, you know, 30 minutes the people working there have to fluff them back up. They don't do that. What they do is they hang them on hangers and nice little displays. And then the, you know, the guy comes back there, the lady comes back and the man's looking at the shirt. They always like to say something complimentary. You know, they're like, oh, wow, with those broad shoulders, I'm sure you would fit in a, you know, a 42 just perfect or whatever they say, right? So you say, I like that shirt right there. They pull the shirt down and they, or they don't pull the shirt down. They say, well, let's go in the back and see if I have one. They'll go in the back and they open up this box. They open up the tissue. You can hear it and you can smell it and everything looks perfect. And they look at it and they say, they say this shirt looks perfect for you. And uh, they'll say, this will be $90 and you'll pay for it and whatever. Well, you can go down to Kohl's or whatever and buy the same shirt on sale for like 24 bucks sometimes. So, so the thing about it is it's all in the presentation. So if you have not done this, I'm going to encourage you to do this. I actually just went to the dentist today to get my teeth cleaned. And uh, so I do that. And uh, last week I actually went to the doctor and it's kind of a hard time seeing my computer because I have a long, I have a contact in, in my right eye, which is my actual, my good eye. And it's, it's helping me with long distance, but it doesn't help me looking at this computer screen. So I'm, it, it'd be funny if you watch me, you'd see me with a magnifying glass in my hand. It's kind of funny. But anyway, so I went to, uh, to an optometrist on Friday. Well, I encourage you to do this every once in a while. Go to the dentist or an optometrist or whatever. Watch how they do their office procedures. It'll blow you away. Sometimes they're really sloppy or sometimes they're not or sometimes you learn things. You know, it's really funny. I went to the dentist uh, this past year and they went through this whole process and the things that I'm going to teach you how to do to walk a person through to get them to say yes at the end, they did the same thing to me. And I was like, oh man, that's fantastic. Okay, so let's do this. We're going to learn the art of mastering. We're going to master the art of the talking exam. But what I'd like to do now is ask Dr. Anderson if we have any questions. Yeah, I don't see any questions right now. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. Well, I'm going to encourage you guys, if you want to ask questions, please do. We're going to move more rapidly for this next 30 minutes because the first, I was really trying to lay a foundation. Okay. Master the art of the talking exam. Um, you know, learn to say the most powerful words when doing your history and physical exam. We're going to need to get some labs on that. Learn how to say that. I kid you not. Um, you know, I'll be checking patients. And I will say frequently, we need to get some labs on that. Now, I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you a bunch of different pictures. And it's going to be fun for you clinically, maybe. You, you may or may not learn some. You, you've probably seen some of these. If you haven't, it'll be good for you. But in any case, I want, to, I want to talk about this in terms of the person has come in. They have come into my office, into my, you know, play with my football in my backyard, right? My rules. Uh, I've set the rules. So they've come into my domain, they've come into my place, and I've done a history on them. And then I've done, I'm doing my, I'm doing my, what I would call real-time observation. This is, this is what I'm doing. I haven't even done my physical exam yet at this point. I'm just looking at them, right? And so what I'll do is something like this. So, you know, if you look at this right here, you see that, you know, the eyebrows, we look from the lateral third, 
we won't drop down right here. You can see those eyebrows are getting a little bit a little bit thinner through there. Now, if this person actually came in and they told me that they had in their history, in their history, if they had fatigue, uh, maybe, you know, and I ask them questions, by the way, if somebody has uh, fatigue, you always want to ask them about brain fog and you want to ask them about dry skin if they have it. If you're suspecting a thyroid, guess what? You ask them all the thyroid questions. And, and I didn't say that a while ago, but if you do, if you do your history, uh, if they filled out this metabolic assessment form right here, and let's say that they say they have fatigue after meals uh, and they must have sweets after meals, um, then you're going to ask them questions like, do you get thirsty a lot? Do you, you increase the appetite? Do you go to the bathroom a lot? Um, you know, do you find that when you eat sweets that it doesn't relieve fatigue? Yes, 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 I noticed that. Do you have a hard time getting up in the morning? Like, do you, do you have to have coffee to get going? Yes, yes, what am I doing? These are all pre-diabetic type signs or diabetic signs. And so I, I picked one or two things that they pulled out and I asked them a lot more questions about that particular thing. Why? Because I'm trying to tighten the noose. Sorry about that. That was a bad joke. It doesn't mean it's a joke, but I'm trying to tighten. I'm trying to bring them closer to what I'm seeing here. I'm trying to say they've come into me with fatigue and they've come into me with neck pain, let's say, okay? Fatigue and neck pain. And by the way, 25 years ago, they had neck pain and they had this chiropractor adjust them one time and it went away and they want that same adjustment because they'd like that 25 year plan on that neck pain. That's what they'd like. They don't realize now they're 53 and now their waist is bigger. You know, their girth is bigger than their waist. They don't realize that now they get tired after they eat. They don't realize that they need coffee to get going because they just kind of live with that. But when you point it in their face and you say, Mr. Jones here, or Mrs. Jones, or Mrs. Jones, here's what's going on, is you have fatigue, and you were telling me when we talked a while ago that you have brain fog, and you say that eating doesn't really fatigue, you have to have coffee to wake you up and get going in the morning, it's hard to go, and you get tired in the afternoon. These are all signs of blood sugar problems, and you know what, when people have blood sugar problems, a lot of times that's what causes fatigue, and it can also cause back pain. We really need to get some labs on that. That's how you do that. And then you're going to look further into physical exam things or whatever you find. I'm sorry, I wrote all of this lady's, all over this lady's fa face here. Oops, sorry. Let me get this again. Okay, so bottom line, what I'm trying to say is when you, when you do the observation, you already know what you know from the history. And when you've done your history, you've tightened that up as much as possible so that when you go to do the observations, you can tell a story. Okay. This is a crease in the ear. We see this right here. This is a, an indication of a drop in circulation. The soft tissue support right here, the collagen that's in this area right here is very susceptible to drops in circulation. And when somebody has drops in circulation, you'll see that diagonal crease in the ear. So what would I do? Somebody comes in and they tell me they come in. I'm going to pick on neck pain again. They come in with neck pain because they know I'm a chiropractor and they heard I do go with neck pain. So it, they come with neck pain. I do a history, and because they did the metabolic assessment form, I actually also found, in the patient diagnostic questionnaire, I also found out that they have shortness of breath. And I also noticed, I also found out they get a little bit of pain in their legs when they walk too far. And then I start the physical exam, and I look at that, and I say, Mr. Jones, you have a crease in your ear. You remember you told me about the neck pain? Yeah, yeah, I did. You also told me about shortness of breath. You remember that? Yeah. And we talked about the fact you get pain in your legs. Well, you know this right here, and I'll take a picture of my iPhone, and I'll show it to them. You know what that means? That means you have low circulation. I think there might be some cardiovascular issues. We need to get some labs on this. And after I've done my exam, I've said that about five times. And so when it's at the end of the examination, it is not a surprise to the person when I say, we need to get some labs. So, uh, and by the way, when you're doing the DAPSI practice, we do our history, we do our physical, but just as important for us, for the physical, is a history and physical is our labs, which includes some level of blood in, in your analysis. Because to really get a complete look, we can't know what these things are. We just don't know what these things are. You don't know what's under the hood unless you look. So uh, let me go back to this right here. So somebody comes in, you have a, a man that's losing hair on his legs. This can be drops in circulation. Uh, it can be low thyroid. 
So you just want to get those things down. You look at that, uh, see if anything matches in their history, and then you tie that together. You say, Mr. Mr. Jones, I noticed you said you had brain fog, and I noticed you have lateral third of your eyebrows gone. I see the hair has gone in your legs. You might have a low thyroid. That might be causing this condition for which you came in. We're going to need to get some labs on that. Thick toenail. When you see one toenail like that, many times it's low circulation. Uh, it can also be from, uh, you know, a, a polyneuropathy. It can be for some kind of autonomic dysfunction. It can be from a fungal infection. It can be a lot of things. But if you have other indications of circulation, then just go ahead and go for it. Talk to them about circulation. This is a patient I had the other day. That's a circulation problem. You know, you have somebody with this many fungals. There's a good chance they might actually have a yeast infection. So the person comes in, they come in with shoulder pain, but they also admitted to you that they have itchiness on their skin. Well, you're going to look at their skin, see if you see anything, but you're going to say, Mr. Jones, it looks like there's a possibility you might have an underlying yeast infection that's causing the itching on your skin, and that's why that's doing that. And he'll say, well, I didn't know that. You know, my mom had that. Everybody in my family had that. Well, you know what? We're going to need to get some labs on that. We need to understand what's going on with you. You know, here's a sock distribution. Guys will come in and say, well, I wear a boot, so I wear out the, the hair on my legs. Well, it's not really true. This is a actually a sign of a, of a polyneuropathy. Uh, the, the small nerves uh, start right about here, and the large nerves uh, end right about there. So these small nerves are affected in your polyneuropathy, so you see that. You want to check that out. You might not be into that. Don't get worried about it. Don't get concerned about it. Um, Paylor, you know, somebody has this, and she has a lot of makeup, but you can see, look at those lips right there and, and the skin right there. And this lady actually had a ferritin that they, the lab came back and said it was less than one. Uh, and within, within two weeks, we had this person feeling like a normal person again. So we used fair keel and vitamin C. It was perfect. But anyway, um, here's another sign. I do this on all patients. I just look under their eyes right here, and, and, uh, and, and I will look at that. Uh, you can look at fingernails. You see these Paylar fingernails. These are anemia things we're looking at. Sometimes you'll see the spoon uh, fingernail. That can uh, sometimes mean an iron deficiency. So what would you do in a physical exam if somebody has that and they're tired? You say, Mrs. Jones, you see that? You see this right here? Uh, that could be from iron deficiency, but I don't know. We're going to have to get some labs on that. And that's how you do this. Um, and also you do, I talked about talking exams. This would be brittle fingernail. How would I handle a talking exam with a brittle fingernail? I would look at that and say, Mrs. Jones, you have, you see your fingernails right here? Those fingernails are weak. Now, when somebody's fingernails are weak, it can mean a lot of things, but basically what it means, it just means the system is not as healthy as it needs to be. A lot of times it can be from somebody having low adrenals or they can have low thyroid, but keep in mind from what we've talked about, when people have low thyroid and low adrenals, it could become from something else. So we're really going to need to get some labs to really understand what's going on with you. And then you just go on from there. That's the talking exam. Um, you know, uh, ridges in the fingernails. A lot of people say thyroid goes vertical and, you know, adrenals go horizontal. I find no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, but if you have, you know, if you have vertical ones, it can be thyroid. It can just be somebody not healthy. It could be adrenals. It could be a lot of things. Dark circles, you know, the eyes. We always think about adrenals. You know, we always think about adrenals in those. Uh, here's something you want to look at pupils. If you notice, <clears throat> a couple things we'll look at pupils. We'll shine a light in their eye from tangentially. And we'll watch to see how that constricts and see if it'll hold that constriction. It should hold it for about three to five seconds. It's not able to hold it. It immediately, you know, instead of it immediately dilates. Then this can be, not necessarily, but it can be an uh, indication of a, some adrenal uh, loop problems. You know, something else to notice on this patient, notice the size of that pupil versus the size of that pupil. You know, you may not be into this. If you're not into this, you don't need to go this way. But this would be an indication that they have an autonomic nervous system imbalance more than likely. And this side of the brain is not, uh, is not as healthy. And so, the, and so the sympathetic nervous system is, is taking control on this side, and that's the reason why that's up like that. So you might not be up to that. You, know, you, know, you, you don't need to do that if you're not up to this. And let me back up right now and say something. This is really important. This is really important. Pick out... Uh, let's do it this way. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's say that we have our exam. Okay. And let's say that we do our screen exam. And I'm going to suggest 
on your chiropractic patients that you develop what's called a screen exam. A screen exam is not the exam that you would do when you're trying to take the board for the DAPSI. It's not the, the exam you would do if you're trying to uh, impress other DAPSI doctors. It's not the exam you're doing if you really want the in-depth picture of what's going on with this picture, with the, what's going on with this patient. But a screen exam is something that you can do five to seven minutes. You know, no more than five to seven minutes, maybe eight minutes, you know, 10 max. But you want a screen exam that you can do very quickly. And I will give you an example. One of the things that I will do is I'll look at the face, I'll look at the hands, I'll look at the feet, I'll look at the belly. I can do that very quickly. I can do it in 10 minutes. I'm going to give you a rundown of what I do, and then I'm going to encourage you not to do what I do, but to develop your own system based upon your own deal. And let me explain it this way if I can. I'm going to do my absolute best, and I apologize if I screw this up. Nobody knows what this is, right? What this is, is a sh these are shoebox from three different angles. This is the left side, this is the right side, and this is the top, okay? And what we see is we see four different holes. And let me just say, inside that shoebox is the same thing. But you may look in this hole, and I may look in that hole, and somebody else may look in that hole, and we're seeing the same thing. You might be the person that, man, you're all about the liver and the GI, and everything comes back to liver and GI. You might be the person that you really bend a lot on infection. You might be the person that really bends a lot on thyroid adrenals. And I encourage you to actually be well-rounded and do all of these. <clears throat> but from a patient perspective and actually communicating with patients, you might find it easier to go through whichever hole you can go through as far as to explain what you're trying to say. And what I mean by this is develop a screen exam. Here's what I will do. I'll do cranial nerves three, four, and six, just looking at the eyes. I'll do cranial nerve seven, have them uh, uh, lift their eyebrows up, have them look down, have them smile, look at that, and I'll look at their facial tone. Uh, I'll look at cranial nerve 10, I'll have them say, ah, and I'll look at the back of that little, you know, that little uh, flapper, the uvula, I'll see how this raises, and I'll also do a gag reflex, I'm trying to check out the vagus nerve, and I'll also do 12, that's sticking out the tongue. I, you know, and I can develop this more for you if you would like, but I'm just trying to give you an idea. I can do that very quickly. If I see any problem with any one of those, I can relate it back to about any symptom that you can imagine, <laughs> you know, because I know the rules of the game. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I can also look at the hands. Uh, oh, I also look at the face uh, on everybody's face. I'm going to look at the lateral third. I'm going to see if they're puffy on the eyes. I'm going to look at the skin tone, any pigmentation. I'm going to look at the pupils. Um, I'm going to look at wrinkle patterns. Uh, I'm going to see if they have any peach fuzz on their side of the face. If they have peach fuzz down here, that's generally an insulin resistance sign. Um, I'm going to look at their lips. I'm going to pull their eyebrows, their eyelids down to see if they have anemia. And I'm going to look at, that's it. And I'm going to look in there. I will go ahead and look in their ears and I'll look in their mouth. So, so I can do this in literally just a, a few minutes. When I find something, I take a picture, I show it to the patient, I show them what that is, I explain what that means, and I start building the bridge between what I found and the symptoms that they presented with. Somebody comes in with shoulder pain and I see dark circles under their eyes. I'll say, oh, you see those dark circles under your eyes? Have you ever seen that? And she'll say, yeah, I've noticed that. I want, I've always wondered why those were there. Well, that could be a sign that you have low adrenals, and let me show you this, and then I'll draw out a picture. I'll say, here's the brain right here, and here's a kidney. Above the kidneys, you have the adrenals. The brain has to talk to the adrenals because the adrenals kick out cortisol, and that's your stress hormone. Now, what we find, and the cortisol goes back to the brain, so the brain knows how much is there, so you have this loop that's going on all the time that keeps everything in balance. But when this gets out of whack, a lot of times we can see people that dark, dark under their eyes, but not only that, but that can also cause chronic shoulder pain. And you see how we do that. Now, I'm not making anything up because if you can't, if you're trying, you know, you don't tie things that aren't there. But let me just say this. We talked about the base trio because it is the base trio. If somebody has something coming that's going on that's more chronic in nature, it's always going to be tied to that base trio. You just have to find it in the physical exam. You just have to find it in the history. It's there. I guarantee it's there. You just have to find it and train yourself to learn how to do it. So we're not trying to make things up. I just want to make that point. Okay, so somebody has flappy arms right here. 
This is the jiggle test right here. That can be a low mitochondria. So what do I, what do we know already when somebody has a low mitochondria? They're going to have low oxygen. They're going to have a lot of times they're going to have low energy. Uh, they could even have low brain function like brain fog, you know, slow to think. They could be, you know, they could be tired. You know, these are things. So if you see that right there, you look at that and, and uh, you've already done your history to find out. Now, they walked in your door. You already know if they're flabby. You saw them walk in the door, right? And then you ask them questions and you see that they're tired. In your mind, you're already tying this together. So then you're going to have a conversation. You're not going to tell them they're fat, obviously, but you're going to, you know, talk to them. This is, a, this is a patient, dear sweet lady. We talked about that. You know, lateral third of the eyebrow is thinning, but also this right here, you'll see this little puffiness a lot of times on thyroid patients. So when you see that and the lateral third thinning right there, very good indications of a possible thyroid. So you've already done your history, but let's say they didn't give you any information on that. Um, you can just say, this looks like it could be a thyroid. They say, well, I don't have any symptoms of thyroid. Well, you know, sometimes people don't have any symptoms of it, but this definitely looks like a sign of that, and it might be leading to the neck pain. We really probably need to check this out. And then you're going to, you know, do some more things to get to the point where you're going to say we need to get some labs on this. <clears throat> if you see these skin tags right here, that's, that's a sign of insulin resistance. So somebody comes in, you see that right there. Say you have a chiropractic patient that you see right now. You would like to convert and maybe get them in doing some blood tests. You look at that and you look at them and say, Mrs. Jones, I was checking you here and I saw you have these skin tags. Did you notice those? She said, yeah, I have them on my neck. A lot of times insulin resistance, they have them on their neck and on their arm. And you say, yeah, I noticed that. You know, that's a sign that you, have, you could have blood sugar problems. And you know, that might be why you're having dot, dot, dot. We really should get some labs on that. This is acanthos uh, nigricans. You'll see that. That's a sign of insulin resistance. Another one right here. Acanthos nigricans. You know, here's a guy right here uh, looking at facial tone. Like, you might not be into this, and if you're not, don't worry about it. You know, I'm talking about the mini exam. Do your, your, your screening exam. Um, and let me back up and say it again. You know, I'll go through my cranial nerves. I'll look at the face. Then I'll look at the hands. I've got a gun that, not a gun, but a temperature gun, and I'll measure the, 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 the temperature in their fingers compared to the temperature in their wrist. And if you've got eight, you know, you know, six, eight degrees difference between their fingers to the, uh, from their fingers to their wrist, we know that they have a huge load firing sympathetic nervous system. They've got a, you know, they've probably got, maybe possibly got some adrenal problems. They could have some blood sugar problems. There's a lot of things that that can indicate, but basically we know that their brain is doing this. The top part of the brain, the top of the brace, the top part of the base of the brain turns on the brain. That's what makes it go. And when somebody has cold hands, cold feet, um, basically the brain is the gas is on and it's just not stopping. It's just going on and on. A lot of times you ask them and say, "Man, you ever feel like your brain's just running on and on?" Oh yeah, all the time. So cold hands, cold feet. And this is also another one, cold hands, cold feet. We've talked about this one, cold nose. Uh, you know, these can be circulation problems, brain problems. So anyway, when you see, when you see cold hands, cold feet, uh, then that, you know, that gives you an opening to talk about what's going on. Um, you look at the hands for fingernails, you know, the, the ridges of the fingernails. You're going to look at capillary refill time. Um, you're going to go down to the feet. You're going to do the same thing. You're going to look for fungals. You're going to look for skin. See the dry skin. It's the best place to see dry skin. You're going to look for hair on the legs. You're going to look for things. And when you do your brief exam, pick out about 15 things that, boom, you can do just like this. And it helps you really visualize what's going on with that from a base trio standpoint that can help you relate to what's going on with the symptoms that present from a chronic position. I hope you understand that. And so then you're going to take that and start bringing them in. And then I'm not encouraging you to do slack exams. I'm saying that this is the case that comes in. They just want chiropractic. They don't want anything else. I just want just just my neck. You know, I just that's all I need. And, you know, you're going to look at them real quick. I said, well, let me look at something real quick. Wow. Did you notice you have a crease? in your, your ear right here. Um, and did you notice that you also have a fungal in your toe? And did you know you're, you're 62 years old? Anybody in your family ever have a heart attack or anything? Yeah, my dad did. Well, guess what? You have low circulation. We really should check that out. I really want to adjust you today. We're going to get that done, but we probably really start should think about getting some labs. What do you think about that? Boom. So uh, let's go ahead and go through this. We have a few more minutes and I, I really do want to finish this up. Um, 
this is dry skin, you see those red dots on the end of the tongue, this is usually a sign that the level of stress that's in the system is more than the body's handling. That's kind of a Eastern medicine thing. It's not really a traditional, you know, medical thing. But if you see the red dots on the tongue, that is a level, a lot of times you can relate to the adrenal loop problems, thyroid problems, everything comes back to that. You see scalloping on the tongue like this. This is very characteristic. Scalloping that looks exactly like that is very characteristic of a thyroid. <clears throat> and if you see these eyes bolted out here, you see that right there? This is, this is a very classic thyroid presentation. If you saw somebody come in like this and they had neck pain, you should be able to look at them and say, Mrs. Jones, you see this right here, the puffiness under your eyes right there, and you take a picture of your tongue, you see that? That's called scalloping. These are signs of a low-functioning thyroid. That might also be, and it does, it could have something to do with their neck pain. We need to get some labs on that. Functioning hypothyroid, you look at the lateral third, you also look at that right there. Um, and I don't know if this will play, we'll try it right here. But, you know, one thing you can have people do is do just basic balance things. If they can't do that, it means the brain's not working. And if the brain's not working, guess what? You have to find out where the inflammation is coming from. You explain that to the person. You say, Mrs. Jones, when I see this right here, if I saw that right there, here's, what, here's exactly what I would do. I would say, Mrs. Jones, you see this right here? Here's the brain. Here's the nose. Here's the mouse. Here's the base of the brain. This right here is what gives you balance. And when this right here is failing, that's what it looks like right here. And I show her that video. The number one thing, Mrs. Jones, that causes that to fail, it, the number one thing is inflammation. I must get some blood work with you so I can understand why your brain is doing what it's doing because if it's doing that, it's actually aging too fast. What is she going to say? No, I don't want to do that. This is a person that came to me um, and watch her arm swing. Watch the right arm that, or left arm that's not swinging. See that? See that? Now, you might not be into that, but if the left arm does not swing, it means that the right side of the brain is not functioning properly. I'm going to talk to this patient, and I did. And I said, you know the number one thing that causes that? Inflammation. We have to, and, you know, possibly she's had concussions and other things we have to deal with. But in general sense, inflammation. So I'm going to draw that. See pigmentation on the skin? We don't know what that is. In this case, it was actually melasma, but we don't know what that is, which means too much estrogen. But when I see something like that, it gives me an opening say, we need to get some labs. I didn't know this guy had hemochromatosis, but I knew he had that. And I knew he was tired. And I said, you know, Mr. Jones, you have this on your skin right here, and you're tired right there, and I know that you've had low back pain. But this could be a sign of something else that I'm just not going to be able to see without looking at labs. We need to get some labs on that. We got the labs he had. Actually, the only person I've ever seen with primary hemochromatosis. I have just a few more minutes, and I actually have a few cases I want to go through. I'm not sure it's going to work. We'll do our best. Here's tongue scalloping. Cherry angiomas, when you see that right there, it's a good indication that they're not converting. They're not converting hormones well. You'll see this a lot. You know, you'll see when guys have prostate problems, not all the time. You know, somebody would have a prostate problem, they wouldn't necessarily have that. But if you have that, it means they're not converting. For ladies not converting estrogen properly, um, you know, you want to get some labs on that. I'm telling you, you know, get some labs on that and understand what's going on, um, you know, to, to work with that situation. Uh, these are all signs of thyroid right here. You know, the dry skin, the scallop tongue, and the, this is myxedema down here of the legs. Somebody comes in, they look like an apple right here. You already know. You look at this person right here, you already know. They're going to get tired after they eat. You know that. You already know that they're going to be sluggish in the morning. Uh, you already know these things, right? So you're going to direct your history on this, and whatever symptom they have, you're going to tie it to that so you can bring them to you, so you can get them under a lifetime, um, awesome, uh, you know, natural internist, chiropractic internist care. I really do have to mention one more thing before we go, and if you guys want to stick around, I will do cases for you. Invest in a whiteboard. It'll make you a lot of money, and it'll help a lot of sick people get well. I have a big whiteboard by my office. I do my history. I do my physical exam when I do my physicals. When I do, I talked about the, the brief physical. I will do a longer physical because now I don't have a lot of patients that come in just for, you know, they want their shoulder popped or whatever. I just don't have any of those patients at all. I have patients coming in to me for, you know, whatever conditions, you know, for the, for the chiropractic internist. And so I'm already doing full complete exam, so I still do the talking exam. At the end of the day, 
you know, my my bailiwick, if you will, is the brain. I always like talking about the brain because I, I grew up a chiropractor and I love brain to body. I love the power that made the body, heals the body. I love the brain communicates to the body and keeps it well. I love that whole, you know, idea. So, so I see the brain controlling the thyroid. I see the brain controlling the adrenals. I see the brain controlling the sex hormones. I see the brain controlling the gut and the gut also has an influence on the brain. I see all these things. So when a patient comes in and I've done my exam and my nurse Mariah, if she's listening, she might be listening tonight, she would attest to this. 100% of the time, and I'm not going to say 100% because who, no, who could be 100%, let's say 99% of the time when I go to the whiteboard, here's how I do it. I will do my history, I will do my physical exam, I'll go to the whiteboard and I draw the brain and I draw whatever system's going on, I relate it to their symptoms and then I leave a little space down here, I leave a little space down here and I do this. I say, Mrs. Jones, now that we've seen all these things, I need to see what your liver's doing, I need to see what your thyroid's doing. I need to understand what your immune system is doing, make sure you're not having an infection. And I just need to check, I just need to check a lot of things out. I'm going to need to get some blood and we're going to get some urine from you. Okay? So then here's what's going to happen. This is a beautiful part. I promised you, I didn't promise you, but I told you. If you watched and stayed in for this hour, and right now we're one hour in, I was going to show you something that was going to pay for Christmas in two weeks. And here it comes. Right here it is. This right here is it's an old price sheet. Our prices, I'm sure, have gone up since then. But anyway, <laughs> but um, so this is a price sheet. We have a price sheet, and this is just like a regular 8 by 11 and a half or whatever size piece of paper is right here. And here's what's going to happen. My nurse, I don't even have to tell her this. My nurse knows exactly what I'm thinking when I think. I tell her all the time. I say, she writes most of my notes for me. I say, I don't want you just to write down, you know, what I said and what the patient said, but I want you to write down what I'm thinking when, I, when, I, when we were talking. So it's kind of funny she can actually do that. But let's say on this patient, I recommended a food sensitivity and a Kessinger Health and Wellness panel, and she needed a micro UA. Okay, so my nurse sees me draw on the whiteboard. She already knows where I'm going. She draws these circles, these three things, and I apologize. I did not add this up. Uh, I'm going to 400, 500, uh, 600, 600, and 700, and uh, that's $700. It's not, but let's just say it's $700, okay? So she's going to write $700 right here, right? Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do, I'm at the whiteboard. Follow me on this. I'm on the whiteboard. This is me at the whiteboard. And this, actually, I didn't even know I did that, but that's me. That's exactly what I did right there. So I looked at her and I said, we're going to need to see on this patient. I said, blood sugar, thyroid, adrenal, chronic infection, whatever I wrote right there. And I said, we're going to need to get some labs. Uh, Mariah, or, and I'll say, you can go with Mariah, which is my nurse. Okay. Then Mariah takes her back, does not say a word about the price. Catch this is so important. She takes a clipboard and she hands the clipboard to the patient who, by the way, at this time, this patient better be. If she is not 100 percent, if she is not 100 percent that Dr. K is my favorite doctor ever, he saw things that nobody has ever seen before. If, if we haven't got her at that point, we don't have a patient yet. Um, we just don't. We don't have a patient. So. She's going to go back and she's going to, with a clipboard, sit down with that patient and say, Mrs. Jones, Dr. Kessinger made the following recommendations. And she'll hand it to her and she'll circle the 700 and say, do you have any questions? And then he who talks next loses. <laughs> I'm saying that jokingly because this is a win-win, of course. But... Your nurse is instructed to zip her lip until the patient speaks. Nobody speaks until the patient speaks. If it's an uncomfortable one minute, let, be an, let it be an uncomfortable one minute. But whoever, whoever, remember we're framing the debate, whoever speaks next is the one who pulled to the other side. So that patient's going to say, nope, I don't have any questions. And then that gives you free uh, access to put cold steel in that patient's arm and find out things that's going to revolutionize their health and life and give them much more than what they're paying for. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I do have some cases I'd love to go through, but I'm going to do this. Dr. Can Anderson, do we have any questions? 
Yes, there's two questions. Yes, let's have them. Okay, uh, the first one, and you kind of went through, but you may want to zero in a little bit. It just says, how do you get in and out without spending an hour with one patient? person says they have a tendency to teach the patient and then realize they blew a big chunk of time. Okay, congratulations. That means you're growing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that means you're growing. And uh, now what we have to do is we just have to refine that. And I, here's a couple of suggestions that I will make. Um, you know, I learned a long time ago. I used to see patients five days a week. I used to see patients actually six days a week, and then I went to five days a week. Okay. And then I learned from this program, from this guy who really taught me a lot. And he said, you know what? You could see all the patients you're seeing right now in three days. You just work harder. It would be more intense. And actually, you would have a more experience. And at the end of the day, you'd make more money. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. But what the heck? I'm the guy who jumps off the cliff and then starts worrying about, you know, sewing a parachute together. So let's go ahead and try it. So, um, I, I, so I did it, and I found out he was absolutely correct. And so what I mean by that is this. Let's say that you're seeing patients four days a week. Let's say you're seeing patients full day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Here's what I'm going to suggest you do. Let's take off one afternoon, maybe two afternoons. Okay? So you're going to take off a Tuesday afternoon, Thursday afternoon. You pick. Right? So you've got Tuesday afternoon, and you've got three hours here, and you've got three hours there. Or you might just start, let's just start Thursday afternoon, three hours. Okay? You know you're into this, and you want to do this. So on Monday morning, Mrs. Jones comes in, the one you've been seeing forever, but you really, really want to be doing deeper work on her, but you just didn't know how to really go into it. Well, take the things that you've learned tonight with the history and the DAFSI program, and, you know, you find something on her that relates to that base trio that you can bring back to her symptoms. You say, Mrs. Jones, I see this, this, and this, 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 and this. Do it very quickly. Don't spend a lot of time, because believe me, People are not going to go with you because you teach them for a long time. They will not. They don't need an hour spent. They need very focused. Mrs. Jones, lateral third of your eyebrow is gone. You have dry skin. That could be a low thyroid. I think that's related to that chronic neck pain we've been adjusting for every, every once a week for the last three years. We need to get some labs. What do you think? And you'd be shocked. You're going to wet your pants. She's going to actually going to do it right? So, excuse me for that, it's getting late. But anyway, so so here's the deal, is that, you know, you don't, on your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday patients, you don't want to spend a lot of time, and if it feels like it's starting to get to be a long time with a patient, say, Mrs. Jones, I really want to investigate this first, th uh, uh, further, please come in on Thursday afternoon, because I'm going to take time for my patients, uh, that we're going to work through deeper issues with this. I'm going through a diplomate program where I'm learning about internal diagnosis and how to really get into these issues a lot deeper, and I would love for you to come out on Thursday afternoon and do that. So, so I would do that, and another thing to do is when you do your initial exams, when you do your initial exam, uh, add in that brief five minutes, seven minutes, where you can you know, check those 10 or 15 things that give a reflection off the base trio, okay? You have another question? Yeah, one more here. It says, how do you handle a patient that states they have current labs from another physician? What do you consider current? And uh, we all know the uh, complete. Um, okay, it says, we all know that they never have complete labs. How do you yes. address that? Oh, here's what, here's what I would do. Here's exactly what I would do. Um, you know, there's a saying when you want to negotiate, because that's what you're doing. You're negotiating. Remember, you're framing the debate. It's a negotiation. So what you do is agree and change. Agree and change. Agree and change means this, is that you agree. You say, oh, that'd be fantastic. I would love for you to bring those in. They're six months old. No problem. Bring them in. I'm not going to argue with a patient at that point because I haven't seen the I haven't seen the labs yet. I don't know what they mean. I don't. They, I know I'm going to need new ones, but I want to be from a position of strength to say that. So this person paid you know six hundred dollars on these labs, and they want you to look. Or they say you want to run labs. They say, well, I just had labs run, and they had them done six months ago. You know, and I know that they're not going to be the labs we need. But you're not at a strength position to tell them at that point. You're not going to say, no, those, valves, those labs are not going to be valid. We're going to have to do new ones right now. All you're going to do is turn them off. So you're going to say, you know what? That's a great idea. Let's do this. 
in your nurse. You say, nurse, could you help her work through the process of getting those labs over to us before the next time she comes? I'm not going to rely on her bringing them because she's going to forget them and then she's going to forget them. Then we're three months down the road and we've not done anything. So I'm going to have my nurse like a, a hound dog getting after those, calling her, calling the doctor and getting those labs. And then when she's going to come in the next time, then I'm actually going to use those labs and I'm going to read them very quickly. And I'm going to say, wow, looks like your liver enzymes were a little bit low and the BUN was a little low. Looks like your liver was congested then. That might be what's going on with you now, but we probably better update these so we can really know what's going on. But here's what's going to happen that's going to surprise you. You're going to read their labs much better than they've ever been read before. Don't spend an hour doing it. You can do it in five minutes. You can read those labs better than their medical doctor read them for them. The medical doctor didn't sit down and talk to them. The nurse called them on the phone and said everything was normal. You're going to sit down and show them what some of those values mean and why their liver's congested and why that could be why they're having an upset stomach all the time or whatever the case may be. And when you say that, you get confidence with them. And then when you say then, we're going to need to get some new labs, they'll generally go with you because you built the confidence. Any more questions? And that's it, right? Okay, so I think that was I think that was excellent. Uh, I'm going to look for uh, I oh my goodness I had so many of these right here. Um, uh, I can't do it. I can't do it. But I'm going to do one last one. This patient came in because it was a regular chiropractic type patient. The patient comes in and he came in because it, this says arms right here, but it was actually neck. He came in for neck pain and, and chest and arm and arm pain, and he was sent in by somebody else and he just wanted to get adjusted. Now it was kind of unusual, but I have that every once in a while. And he also said he had high blood pressure, but he didn't come in to me for that. And if you notice when he fell out the metabolic assessment form, when somebody puts zeros like that all the way up and down, what they're saying is, I am not interested. <laughs> I am not interested in what you're selling. <laughs> and I'm like, that's okay. I'll get you. All right. So anyway, I'm just teasing, having fun. But you know, I examined him and I noticed he had some sinus issues and that had just started about two weeks ago, about the time all this pain started. And I told him, I said, you know what? There's a possibility that sinus infection, you might be having an infection and that might be why this has all come on. We need to get at least, you know, a white blood cell count to look at that. He said, oh, absolutely. Got the white blood cell count. Of course, the white blood cell count was 12, neutrophil 71. We know he has a bacterial infection. We gave him liposomal C and some silver. Uh, within three days, all the pain's gone. He's, you know, I'm his hero. Now the guy is under comprehensive care. I'm doing cardio IQs on him. He's doing, he's doing the full boat. He's all in. He sends everybody in for internal diagnosis with us. But it all started, he came in because he wanted his neck adjusted because he had heard that maybe I was good at necks. I'm an upper cervical guy. So I'm good at necks, so maybe I can help that neck. And by the way, I did help that neck. I'm an upper cervical guy. I had to. So, Okay, so very good. We're going to conclude this right now. I appreciate everybody coming in here. Maybe we'll do the rest of these later. But having a DAPSI practice starts with you. Um, I, I, hope that, uh, I hope that you got a lot out of this. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, I just, you know, wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And God bless every one of you for being here and, you know, being, being a part of this. So thank you for sharing. And we will be talking to everybody very soon.